Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Simon Sinek. I'm an optimist, author, speaker. Um, but most of all, I believe in a world that does not yet exist, a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are, and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do, which is why I'm really excited to talk to my friend Tim Shriver about his new book, The Call to Unite, because it is uniting um, that is more likely to create this world in which we feel inspired, safe, and fulfilled. Um, so, Tim, excited to talk to you about your work and have a conversation about what the future could look like. Thank you, Simon, <laughs> for your years of work and, and your years of coaching for so many millions of people who look to you as a source of strength, as a source of wisdom, and as a source of support for how they want to find their best life, how they want to find their own center of optimism. That's been your gift to so many people. I've seen it live. I've seen it in so many different broadcasts and books. And it's a huge honor for me to be able to share this book with you because uh, we share authorship in this book as do a hundred other people. Yeah. Uh, so I want to welcome all those who are joining us today. Uh, we welcome Q and a in the Q and a box. If you, if you want to contribute or add to the conversation, it would be our, our, our pleasure to engage with the audience as much as we possibly can. About this moment in time, I want to say at the outset, if I could, just to take a pause uh, on this day, so many of us are thinking about and praying for and feeling the sense of loss in Atlanta. Uh, yet again, our country uh, racked by a disastrously painful, horrific uh, set of violent murders. Uh, enough to stop us all and give us pause and challenge us really at a very, at least for me, at a very profound level. Uh, to try to make sense, maybe you can't make sense, but to at least try to feel the pain and, and sense the solidarity of those who are suffering and commit ourselves as much as we can to changing whatever we can to reduce the sense of isolation and horror that contributes to this kind of violent, uh, just uh, tragedy. So I know, Simon, you and I have have seen our share of uh, great sadness. And today we sadly come together at a day when we see it again. Uh, so I know all of our uh, listeners and, and viewers will join us in, uh, in a commitment of uh, both prayer and solidarity, but also a commitment to change. Yeah, so true. Um, I think one of the things that these tragedies highlight, and I think um, it's happened with COVID. It's happened with the shooting yesterday. Um, uh, is is the need for us to come together? I think you know. You yeah. know, whenever there's tragedy, you sort of look around and realize how stupid some of the things that we get stressed out about really are. Mm. You know, um, I remember after September 11th, I sat there and thought my career is stupid. You know, mm. uh, I, I had a career in advertising at the time. I was like, what is the point of this? Mm. And I think one of the things that these tragedies do is they, they, they're a big, they, they offer us perspective. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I was so, you know, that when you, when you invited me to, to contribute to unite, which I thank you very much again, by the way, it's an honor. Um, um, it, it's, I, I mean, and you said very specifically in the title, it's a call to unite. The question I have for you is, is why now? Why is there a call to unite that is more relevant now than maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago that, 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 makes, that makes us need to call? Yeah. Well, I think, it's, uh, I think we're living at a time when people are starving for voices of, as the title says, hope. Uh, I think there's moms and dads who are struggling with kids. There are people struggling to find their way to a stable employment. There are people in very privileged positions who are anxious about the future, feeling separated and removed from each other. I think we live in an age of, in some ways, unprecedented divisiveness. And we're not just separated from each other as Republicans or Democrats or, you know, heartland or coastland or young or old. We're separated from, in some ways, ourselves, right? There's a, there's a, I, I, I when we were starting this, Simon, you know, I, I said on one phone call to one of the people I called to say, would you join? I said, I kind of just spontaneously, I feel like we're in a spiritual crisis. And she said, that's it. Stay yeah. with that. 
I don't mean you should go back to church. It's, but there's something in the soul of America that's wounded right now. And I'm not smart enough to know exactly what it is, but I'm open enough to listen to others and to invite the conversation. So it was a call. I mean, the first steps of this effort were just to actually call people and say, are you willing? Will you try? Do you have a message? And what we got is this beautiful book that, in, you know, that has the voices of nurses and children. It has the voices of grocery store clerks and former presidents, people who've spent years in solitary confinement and people who live in mansions. Uh, and the thing they have in common, you, know, you can see it in the book at any moment and it just open to any page is that they're like you, they're optimists. They believe in the human capacity to overcome suffering and to be in, in, in relationship with people who are, who are in pain but I, I kind of want to ask you, 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 your, your, your brand, your label, your identity is, is this sort of optimist, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, you're unapologetically optimistic. True. Um, and so many people right now aren't. Yeah. Um, so help us, you know, see not just what you've written in the book, but how you've, how you've traveled from that moment when you were in advertising uh, and thinking, you know, maybe I need to make a change to where you land now, where you kind of, seems like you're just waking up in the morning, finding ways to restore hope both in yourself and in others. Well, I think optimism is a misunderstood uh, disposition. Um, It is not naive. You know, it's not blind positivity. You know, everything's good. Everything's fine. You know, that's not healthy. You know, in in a dark period where a, a leader shows up to their team and attempts to be really positive because they think the team needs that, that's not healthy. That actually makes people feel worse because they feel bad and they see, Mm. you know, their leader every day showing up positive, positive, positive. And it makes them think maybe it's me. Mm. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. Optimism is not blind positivity. It is not a denial of the current state. Optimism is the undying belief that the future is bright. Mm. Um, You know, but we can accept the darkness. You know, we are in a dark tunnel. It's going to be hard. I don't know how long we're going to be here. And, um, but I know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And I know that if we work together, only if we work together, will we, will we come through this stronger than we went in? That to me is optimism. And you hear it, you know, you, you, when, you know, when you're, uh, when you're waiting for something and somebody says, do you think we're going to get it? I go, no, I'm optimistic about it. We're talking about the future. Mm. I'm optimistic. Tomorrow will be a bright day. Um, so, so I am, it's not a done. I can, I can be sad. I can be depressed. I can be sh- stressed out. But that doesn't negate um, my belief that the future is bright. And I think optimism is a very, very important quality, especially especially those in a leadership position. So in the book, Simon, um, let me take let, take a step back just for a second and see if the, see if this makes any sense to you. Daniil Schmall, who was a nurse in the middle of the worst days of the pandemic, writes mm. about you know, at first being overwhelmed and then intubating patient after patient and then starting to lose patients and then closing down. So families couldn't be there and then holding people as they breathed their last breaths and their families were absent, holding up iPhones. And then one day just collapsing Yeah, on her way home, just sobbing. Yeah. And she said to the Uber driver, this is in the, in, in her selection, she said, you know, I don't think people understand what we're going through. Yeah. And the driver said to her, how could we, if you don't tell us? Yeah. Yeah. And she shared her story. And for her, the response of people all over the world to her story made her see, I don't know if it's optimism, but gave her the strength to know that where she was, was being held and supported by others and that maybe she could get through it. Does does that, is that, I mean, how does that square with your experience? You know, we are social animals and, um, and we are just not good. I mean, this is what I wrote in, in, when you invited me, we're just not good by ourselves. We cannot solve complex problems by ourselves. We cannot lift heavy weights by ourselves. We cannot do this thing called life by ourselves. It's just too difficult. We cannot do this thing called career by ourselves. It's just too difficult. We, we need the help of others. Um, and it's, and it's the building of relationships and the willingness to share our experiences and share our feelings that actually creates um, uh, uh, those unions and creates those relationships. You know, the funny thing about human beings is, you know, shared struggle, shared hardship actually brings us together. 
Right. Um, you know, you think about a tragedy that that takes place in a, in a you know in a confined space, whether it's a tornado or a shooting. In those moments, nobody cares what your politics are. We just care that we'll help our neighbors dig out of rubble. You know, and and human beings are remarkable that way. That we're able very quickly to put aside our our our, our differences that that becomes small when, when there's shared hardship. Um, and, and I agree with the Uber driver, you, you have to share. Yeah. Um, I, when, when COVID began, um, I, I, like many had to go into mission mode. You know, we had a company that made almost all its money from in-person events. I and think I was in your last in-person event, by the way. I don't know. I, we haven't talked about this, but I was just remembering that I think one of your last in-person. It events, was the last one. It was the last one yeah. in Washington, a sellout. Yeah. Uh, at the uh, Lincoln Theater, at the U Street Theater. Yeah. Go. Sorry, I interrupted. No, you. no, that's okay. Um, uh, uh, I completely lost my train of thought. Now you what, were what saying you're, you're, when we went into lockdown, you your business. Oh, right. Basically so, so I I, I went into mission mode because I had to. Yeah. You know, I became fixated and focused entirely on how do I adjust and refine to keep this thing alive, to keep people employed, et cetera. And I called a friend of mine who's active duty military. And I, I asked for advice. I said, how do I stay mission focused? How do I compartmentalize my emotions? Right. And he gave me a warning. He said, you can't. He said, we, when we're in combat, we can compartmentalize our emotions for just a short period of time. He says, but combat is a trauma. And everyone who goes through it will have to suffer through that trauma at some point. Some will suffer immediately and some will suffer months after they get home. He says, I don't feel the suffer of that trauma until four or five months after I get home. He said, he said, COVID is a trauma. Mm -hmm. Everyone is going to have to go through it at some point. Mm -hmm. he, so he offered me a warning. I called all my A-type personality friends. I called all of us, some, some people who thought, oh, I got this thing beat. You know, I'm not, I'm yeah. fine. And I gave everybody a warning that said, we're not going to get through this. And we made a deal that when we start to feel it, we'll call each other. Oh, wow. And sure enough, four or five months in, I started to really feel something wrong and I couldn't mm -hmm. put my finger on it. And I called that same friend. I said, just out of curiosity, what are your symptoms mm -hmm. when you start to feel the trauma? And I offered no leading, uh, leading questions. I just asked him a, an open-ended question. And he said, well, one, he falls out of his sleep habit. He starts going to bed really late for no reason and starts, and he doesn't want to get out of bed in the morning. And I thought to myself, yep. And he said, <laughs> he says, he says he has an unproductive day and he lets himself off the hook. That's okay. You've been working hard. You're allowed an unproductive day. And then he has another and another. And I thought, yep. And then he says, I become antisocial. He says, I don't want to talk to anybody and I don't want to ask anybody for help. And I went, yep. yep. And in that moment, I realized I was suffering you know, depression, which was a word I was uh, afraid to use because it, mm. I didn't want it to be a diagnosis, but it's, it was little D depression. I was depressed. Yeah. And, um, and I asked him, well, when you're suffering the trauma, how do you overcome the trauma? And he said, number one, he forces himself to get back into his sleep habit. You know, he, he, he goes to bed on time. He try, he allows himself to have the unproductive days. And he says, and he forces himself to call people and say that he's struggling and ask for help. And, and I came clean and told him I was struggling and started calling friends. And, 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 and I made a deal with my friends that, uh, and it's a deal that, uh, that persists to this day that I've shared many times, which is um, you never cry alone. If you're going to cry for whatever reason, overwhelm, sadness, just don't know, welling up, you pick up the phone and you call somebody you love and says, I, I just, and you say, I just need to cry. Mm. And it's that feeling of, of unitedness. Uh, yeah. uh, that, you know, it's, it's that feeling that I am not alone, that someone has my back. They have a shoulder for me to cry on, to vent, whatever it is that gives me the courage to keep going. Yeah. And it's when we feel alone that the despair overcomes. Remember suicide is an act of loneliness, Yeah, you know? Um, and, beautiful. and so it's every one of our responsibilities, not, you know, and, and we don't build trust when we offer help, we build trust when we ask for it. Mm. You know, Bren Brene Brown talks about this a lot. Um, uh, and, and so to call somebody and say, I am struggling is much a more powerful tool when it's, of course, of course, genuine than to simply call everybody and say, are you OK? Are you OK? Um, such a, most of us I, do that already. I, I want to repeat that. I want to this is I, I see. Um, 
sometimes in, in your talks, I feel, you know, like even if I'm sitting in the, I, I want to take things out and write them down, but I just want to repeat that because it's in the book in several places and uh, several people reminding us of this lesson. This is a hard one for me. I'm going to be honest. I was raised to help, not to be helped. Right. To me, I remember when I was a teacher, you know, early part of my career as a high school teacher, and we were developing what we now call social and emotional learning strategies. And we got to the lesson where I was supposed to teach kids how to seek help. And I can remember thinking, this is embarrassing. Now, I, I'm embarrassed to say that now. But at that age in my life, I thought seeking help was a sign of weakness. Yeah. And I thought seeking help was a sign of embarrassment yeah. and humiliation and I started to study it and I thought, and I found out, you know, the people who are best at seeking help are the least likely yep. to end up anxious, depressed, addicted, alone. Yeah. Because why? Because they recognize the need when you have it and they respond to their own needs, not yep. to others. Anyway, I just want to underscore this because I think so many people are, I, I, I don't want to be arrogant, but I think a lot of people were raised like me to think the noble thing in life is to offer to help. What you just said is something quite different, which is maybe the noblest thing in life is to ask. So it's, it's you know, there's a paradox to being human, you know? Yeah. Um, like I disagree with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, uh, you know, Maslow says that, you know, the lowest rung of needs is food and shelter. And the third rung is, is human relationships. Well, I've, again, I've never heard of anyone dying of suicide because they were hungry. I've heard of people dying of suicide because they were lonely, which means food maybe isn't the thing. Now, if the paradox is, is that every moment of every day, um, we are both individuals and members of groups, families, churches, companies, teams, whatever it is. And every day we're confronted with little or big decisions. Do I put myself first at the sacrifice of the group or do I put the group first at the sacrifice of myself? And there's an entire school of thought that says, no, 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 you always put yourself first because it, you can't help the group unless you're health, healthy. And there's an entire school of thought that says, no, 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 you always serve the group first because the group can only be there for you um, if they're taken care of. And the answer is you're both right and you're both wrong. I was going to say, it's, which is it? <laughs> it's neither. It's both. <laughs> right. It's because both. because if you always put yourself first, it's, it's a selfish disposition. Most of your relationships are going to be transactional. I'll help you if you help me. And at the end of the day, when you do need help, somebody will either want something in return or you'll struggle to find somebody who genuinely cares. The other thing is if you always put the other, the group first, that's martyrdom. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to hurt yourself and that's not helpful either. And it's this daily balance. It's the struggle. It's a tension that we all have to deal with every day. Um, and, and, you know, where, where I think Maslow, the reason Maslow got it wrong is he only thought of us as individuals, but he failed to consider us as members of groups, you know, the highest peak on his, on his, uh, on his, uh, on his pyramid is self-actualization, oh, which I've all working is the craziest idea. Who can self-actualize? But right? not only that, like, like I spend my life so that I get self-actualized and I can literally sit atop the period pyramid and look down at everybody else who's not self-actualized. What, what kind is, of news is that? That's bad. Kind of news news? Is that? So <laughs> shared actualization to me is something yeah. much more powerful. Yeah. And shared yeah. actualization comes from this balance of service and asking for help. Yeah. The willingness to say, I need help and the willingness to serve. And I think this is where the, the doctors and nurses, you know, um, I think our nation and the industry of hospitals, and yes, it's an industry, um, have failed to look after the people who look after us. Yeah. And, um, you know, I called friends of mine who are ER nurses um, uh, during COVID. And one of the things I learned is, um, there were, this is what they told me, uh, that, you'd be surprised how many ER doctors and nurses in normal times are all functioning alcoholics. Mm. And the number of, the amount of drinking went up during COVID. And there is unfortunately little to no resources given to mental health to doctors and nurses and other hospital staff because it's, it's on the L side of the PNL. Yeah. And so hospital administrators don't provide it. And there's a culture where admitting weakness or asking for help is seen as, 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 well, admitting vulnerability or, or asking for help is seen as weak. And you know, there's, a, there's a space in here. I'm sorry for cutting you off. No, no, please, please. I wanted to just comment, uh, bring, to, bring to life the contribution of Lee Daniels. Lee Daniels, uh, the great director, uh, is in this book. And in, the, in his contribution, when he was asked, 
he he first took a step back um, and started to remember his years before when he was using when he was using alcohol when he was using drugs, and he lived through the AIDS epidemic and many of his friends died, and he was uh, completely lost and alone uh, and desperate and thinking why wasn't he dying? I'm not doing a, 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 a good service to the, his contribution. It's beautiful in the book. I encourage those on the call to check it out. Um, but the point you just made, which he brings up is that in COVID, he, he looked out to all of us to say in COVID, those of you who are like me, who are clean are going to be tempted. And you're going to be tempted because you feel alone. Yeah. Not, not because, you know, because you don't feel you're in it with others. Yeah. And he looks straight onto the page into the camera and says, you're not alone. You're not alone. You're yep. loved. Don't use. Yeah. It's going to be hard. Don't use your, but that balancing of we're in it together and not using yeah. is so different than the way people think about, you know, yeah. I got to reduce my fats or reduce my alcohol or, you know, because I've got to draw inward and get stronger yeah. and have more willpower. It's in some ways, it's what you're saying is it's the opposite. You've got to connect more. Yeah. And then you get the chance to reduce your dependence on substances that may be very damaging and hurt. I mean, we're, we're, we're coming close to what is my definition of faith, mm. um, which is faith is knowing that you're on a team, even if, even if you don't know who the other players are. Oh, beautiful. You know, and so you it's may another write it down. Damn it. <laughs> you, you may be alone, but that's why that's what faith is. Mm. You're actually not. And you're surrounded by people, some who know you and some who don't, who will be there for you. Um, it's one of the things that I, you know, I have a, I have a close and very loving relationship with the military. Yeah. Um, and the reason I use the word love uh, is because that's the word they use. Mm -hmm. They talk about love all the time and you recognize that they have courage to do difficult things. Um, not because they're born that way, but because they learn to, to love each other. And it's the love they have for each other that gives them the courage to do difficult things and be there for each other. You and I have both had the privilege of meeting people who've risked their lives to save the lives of others, um, thinking that they would die. And they, and went, in, you know, through some miracle survived. And when I asked, why did you do it? You would, no one would have ordered you to do it. No one would have faulted you if you didn't do it. Why did you do it? They all say very similar things, which is because they would have done it for me. Mm. And again, it's that belief that someone is there. Um, I, I, so I'll tell you a big, so I had the opportunity to go as, uh, to Afghanistan, to Bagram, um, as a guest of the U.S. Air Force. And I just went, it was a quick trip for, for 24 hours and um, everything on our trip went wrong. I had two escorts with me. We, the, the minute we landed, 10 minutes after we landed, the base came on a rocket attack. Three rockets hit a hundred yards off our nose while we'd stolen the aircraft. And just like all of this series of things went wrong and I'm not trained for this. I had no responsibility. I went just to, they, they wanted me to go see these men and women of the Air Force doing their mission and then come back and sort of share my insights. So I had no particular responsibilities on the ground, but to witness. And, um, and I'll, I'll spare you the long, the long version of the story. But the deal I made with, the, with, with them was when I came back, I would go back to headquarters, to Mobility Command headquarters and report out what I had seen. And, and, and um, as I said, everything in our trip went wrong and we actually got, uh, we thought we were going to get stranded that we, we couldn't get on a flight home. And we ended up being uh, placed on an unscheduled flight. And that flight was unscheduled because it was with a, um, was a flag draped casket. So I flew for nine and a half hours in an empty C-17 cargo plane with a single flag draped wow. casket in the middle of this aircraft, which I, you know, I changed my, changed my life. It was mm. a very humbling experience to bring a fallen soldier home. And um, when I went back to mobility command and I was standing on the stage with all the brass, all these generals and colonels in the room, and I explained my experience and what I saw and some insights about the Air Force, I wasn't sure if I was going to tell the story about bringing home this flag draped casket. The emotions were still very raw. It was only a week or two since it had happened. Um, and I stopped and I started to well up. Mm -hmm. And I, I, was gonna, I made a decision I was going to tell the story, but I couldn't. I literally couldn't get it out because the emotion was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. if, if this was in private sector, if I was standing on a stage with a room full of, of, uh, of business people, somebody would have said, it's okay, take your time, right? Which is a distancing, right? You, you go ahead and you take the time you need. We think, it's, we think it's an act of generosity, but it's not. 
the four star in the room, two words were spoken in that moment of intense emotion as I wasn't sure I could um, uh, go uh, tell the story. He said, go on. Mm. The, under the, the, the subtext saying, we're here with you, you're safe. Mm. And I realized the stark difference between the private sector and the military. The private sector was, would have said, take your time mm. alone. Mm. We'll wait over here until you're ready. Mm. And the military said to me, go on, you are not alone. Mm. And I've, take, I've carried that lesson with wow. me, that when I have friends who are struggling, I say, mm. go on. Mm. And, and I'm going to cry now. The, the subtext is, we are, you are not alone. I'm with you. I am with yeah. you. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is why I was so, I, I mean, just, mm. just the title alone, sitting on a bookshelf, you know, is, is, is a word we need desperately now in this moment. And we needed it before COVID. COVID yeah. just, COVID just shot, shone a spotlight on it. Yeah. You know, we are a, an ununited states. Yeah. Uh, we are in an ununited world. We are in ununited communities, ununited people, ununited churches, ununited families. And the call to unite is not a nicety. It's, it's a desperate need. We need to be healthy again and productive again Beautiful. and safe to feel safe only comes with a feeling of unitedness. Um, and, and I see it everywhere, and... everywhere I go. The people who are united are the ones that are strong and healthy and grateful. Yeah. <clears throat> Beautiful. And uh, so I th thank you for, for, for noting <clears throat> not just that this book is important, but that there's a larger movement. And, you know, people talk about movements all, well, I'm not a product, I'm a movement, or I'm not an organization. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's- my, my, um, my pizza delivery app is a movement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's uh, it always carries a lot of arrogance, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't claim to be at the center of a movement or even know whether there is a movement, but I do believe that we're hungry for doing something together. We're hungry yeah. for healing these relationships. And, you know, the, one of the reasons your voice is so important, both in this book and more broadly on the national stage, and you and I've talked about this is, you know, it's not just people who want to come to hear you. It's other people who need to be drawn into these conversations. We need to kind of build a, a broadcast vision for coming together, what the military teaches, what you know, in this book, you can hear it from Father Greg Boyle down in South Central L.A., you know, where he says, I'm at the margins so that we'll erase margins. <laughs> you know, I don't go here to help. Yeah. I go here to change. You know, th there are so many voices of people. But if we can pool these voices and see them as our companions, see you as someone with this book. I mean, I, I don't want to overplay it, but I can have your voice on my bedside table when I need you. Yeah. You know, well, I can have father, I can have Bishop Jakes ready to tell me that when I'm feeling pain, he understands and he's going to remind me the pain, which is this beautiful. I, I wonder what you think of it. He says, pain always leaves a gift. Yeah. He doesn't say pain true. is a gift. Yeah. And when you maybe were in that plane coming home, yeah. there was nothing, there was no gift in the loss of life. No, the, the, it was I, a horror, right? I, but maybe there was a, a remnant from that moment that has stayed with you that, I don't know, does that make sense? Uh, no, it's 100% true. I, I believe in balance. You know, and nature abhors a vacuum and, and aims to fill it. You know, this is why we talk about stock market crashes being a correction. You know, <laughs> um, it's an imbalance and nature will fix it, whether we like it or not. Um, and, and we can choose to see the world that way too. You know, people always ask me, you know, do you see the glass half full? I'm like, no, I see the glass completely full. It's half full with water and half full with air. It's completely full. Like, and, 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 the, the, and when people talk about whether something's good or bad it, or right or wrong, it, it, the world is just not that binary. There's so few things in our world that are that binary. It's all context and, 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 and all, all positive has liability and all negative has lessons. Um, you know, almost all of us who've struggled whether it's through personal or family tragedy, um, or, you know, uh, I, I don't know a single successful entrepreneur who hasn't come close to or hit rock bottom. 
And we all say the same thing. You know, my, my family suffered tra uh, tragedy. Your fa families suffered tragedy. And though none of us want to relive any of those things ever again, um, none of that was none of that was a gift. It made our families closer. Right. It brought us together in ways that we never could have without that tragedy. Um, it taught us lessons about ourselves. You know, I think that's the thing about COVID. You know, I, I think I thought it's so funny when the new year happened and everybody's like, oh, goodbye, 2020. Glad you're yeah. well, that's that's not how time works. Right, right. You know, it didn't just end, <laughs> right. you know, the, the arbitrary calendar date <laughs> right. converted. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think, yes, COVID was filled with struggle and stress and strain and it was unequal, which was unfair. Right. Um, but the learning curve was through the roof. Mm, mm. Um, yeah. Many of us learned how to cope. Yeah. We learned what, how we react to stress. We learned who our real friends were. We learned the things that were important to us. We let go of stupidity. Um, I saw friends who lost their careers, lost their jobs. And the way that they came together with their families to find new ways I was in nothing short of inspiring. Yeah. And, 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 and so I think, you know, I think, I think it's you know, one of the huge things I learned in COVID is we can have multiple emotions at the same time. Mm. You can be happy and sad at the same time. Like we don't have to, like, if you're in a good mood about things, you don't have to put on an air of depression because the times are hard. I can be really, really upset because something bad happened and really optimistic because of the, the, the silver lining that will come out of it at the yeah. exact same time. Yeah. I can be depressed and excited simultaneously. You can have yeah. multiple emotions at the same time. Yeah, and, and I often, think that, often they're, they seem opposite, right? They seem not. opposite. Right. And this is, this is the glass analogy, yeah. Yeah. which is you can have it all. You can have both yeah. and you can mourn loss and be excited for future simultaneously. And I think that's something that we need to appreciate more of in, in this. In, and that is to me, the call to unite. It's, it's so, not you know, blind people, and it's people not naive. All the time, you know, like, how can you unite with those people when you disagree with them, when you don't have the same principles? Who are they that you could possibly condone their behavior? And I'm like, no, no, no. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about condoning things that you right. don't agree with. We're not even talking about compromise. We're talking about a both and. Yeah. We're talking about holding an energy and a relationship and a power that binds us, yeah. even as we disagree on those things that we can't see together. It's, it's true. It's just holding a both and. I mean, you know, all of the religions teach us this, you know, like we're celebrating in the next few weeks, Passover. What is Passover other than a moment of great tragedy and great triumph? What is the Christian celebration of Good Friday? We run around, we crazy Christians with crosses. It's an execution moment. Is it horrible or is it transformational? It's both. Yeah, it's both. It's both. It's simultaneous. <laughs> At exactly the exact right. same time. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to underscore the, 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 the thing that I think is really, and you touched upon this, which I think it's worth under, under, uh, 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 underlining, is, is that holding space or, or listening or mm -hmm. uniting is not the same as condoning or agreeing. That's right. And, and, and it is a skill. It is a skill, a learned, a learnable, practicable skill that I think is desperately needed in our nation, right. um, how to hold space for another. Um, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dia Khan. Oh, um, I love Dia Khan. Okay. So, so I, have a, I, have a, I have a film crush on Dia. I don't yeah, know. Dia's work is unbelievable. Remarkable. For those who don't know Dia's work, um, Dia is a documentarian. Um, uh, she's a she's a, a a Muslim woman who was on the BBC, gave an interview, and she talked about you know a, a, a united and diverse culture, and for whatever reason, her little interview uh, was picked up by uh, extremists, um, white supremacists, and she was heavily trolled and uh, and and harassed by white supremacists to the point where the police advised her to stay away from open windows. That's how dangerous it became. And Dia's response to this trolling was to move to the United States and go and meet white supremacists, the opposite of what most of us would do. Yeah. And she 
went around. I, my skin is tingling just hearing you describe it. And I've so seen she, them before. <laughs> she made a documentary called White Right, Meeting the Enemy. And uh, uh, she went and held space for these white supremacists and gave them a safe space to feel heard. Think about that for a second, right? She practiced what I like to call extreme listening, where you're hearing people with opinions that they, they hurt Beautiful. the very core of your, your, your values and your being, and yet you commit to hold space for them. It doesn't mean you condone or agree. It just means you give safe space for them to feel heard. And what started to happen, because if she fought with them, one of them, she, she talked to the leaders of one of the oldest white supremacist organizations in the country. And um, um, he, he was very resistant to giving her any time for the documentary. He gave her a short amount of time, and then he gave her more time and more time and more time. And when she asked him, why are you giving me more time? He said, because usually when I go and do these things or I go on the news, one of two things happens. Either I'm given a platform to spew what I want to spew, which is a win for me, or they turn off my microphone, they, they, they call me despicable, and it's a win for me because I get to be the victim, and right. both are great recruiting tools for me. He says, you are just allowing me to talk, and you're listening to me, and I find that curious. Mm. And over the course of time, what started to happen as she held space for these people is they struggle to reconcile their racist views of the world with their relationship with this young Muslim woman, where they now trusted her and viewed her as a friend, and they could no longer reconcile that she's supposed to be someone they hate. And one by one, they started to drop out of the movement. And us yelling and screaming at them only makes them hunker down. Yeah. And so this this is, it's so hard for us to even conceive. And my point is, is if Dia can learn to listen to a white supremacist, we can learn to listen to somebody with opposing political views. Amen. Amen. It's so Amen. extreme, her example. And we, we can just join in like huge shout out to Dia. And if you haven't, those of you on uh, this call, if you haven't seen White Right, I think it's on Netflix or one of the streaming services. There are moments in there where I feel like she's able, I mean, this is going to sound weird, almost stop time. Yeah. And these men in your uh, that you've described seem to all of a sudden be overwhelmed by the enormity of what's happening to them in these conversations that they have found not the contempt that constrains. But can I say love? Because it's so she's so patient and so welcoming and so suspense. She suspends judgment yeah. long enough and it's a, uh, it's a beautiful thing to watch this happen. So Simon, I want to, uh, we, I could listen to you as many can all day, but I want to ask <laughs> you to pivot a little bit here yeah. to thinking about where we are now. Yeah. Um, Sir Ken Robinson, who, uh, his last speech is in this book, um, uh, asks us in the book about what kind of normal do we want to return to? Yeah. Uh, he and, he, like others, uh, Father Richard Rohr calls this an apocalypse, uh, an unveiling, uh, uh, a turning where, where things change dramatically. Yeah. Uh, and Sir Ken says, what kind of normal do we want? Yeah. As you think about this, and then there's many examples in the book of people with ideas on this, but what can we think or do that doesn't let us slip back into that sense of, Anxiety. I mean, the loneliness statistics, the addiction statistics, yeah. the depression statistics. The yeah. What do we have to do to come out of this better? Well, you know, um, uh, besides buy this book, <laughs> right? So after after September 11th, um, I was in New York when September 11th happened, and I remember for the for more than weeks, I would go on. To, I'd say months, but for, for many weeks after September 11th, New York was the most incredible city. Mm. Um, crime evaporated. It just mm. disappeared. There was none mm. because this shared experience united us in a way that just, it was just an incredible city. And I remember thinking to myself, this utopia that I was living in mm. where, wow. where we cared about our, our fellow humans just on a street corner. We, everybody was more polite. Mm. You know, it was, it was a magical place. Mm. And I remember thinking to myself, we'll forget, this is going to mm. go away, mm. you know? And sure mm. enough, it's, became just another city yet again. I mean, my, my love of New York will never, you know, it's not just a city, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, 
And I think, I think we have to be, I think we have to sort of stop for a moment and, 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 and remember this feeling. And at the end of the day, um, change starts at home. You know, we, we're, we're quick to criticize our politicians and criticize our, you know, our, our leaders. And at the end of the day, I'm a firm believer that we get the politicians we deserve. And our politicians are, quite frankly, a, a mirror reflection of who we are. And if we're complaining that they're judgmental and they're divided and they don't listen and they don't cooperate, well, hello, that's wow. us. Yeah. And I think we at home have to, the, the hard work starts at home. What you're asking is, how do we have the body we want with, but without doing any exercise? And the answer is... <laughs> you're going to have to do the exercise. Yeah. And we're going to have to do the exercise. I remember what, when we were preparing and thinking about this kind of work, I did a focus group in, um, with uh, high school students in Iowa. And we were talking about bullying and about division in school. And one of the young ladies turned to me and said, you know, uh, we've really, we've really gotten rid of most of the bullying in our school, even the cliques. She said, but you know, adults are really bullies. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I spent a lot of my career on anti-bullying. Yeah. <laughs> we may have targeted the wrong population. We, we, we think that 14-year-olds are bullies and 16-year-olds are bullies and 8-year-olds are bullies. But that young woman looked me in the eye and I just felt like, oh, my gosh, exactly what you're saying. If we want to change, we may not be looking at them yeah. so much as looking at us. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever us and them is, you know, like maybe – Maybe all of us on our political factions and we just got to change the other side. Yeah. No, it's change maybe, ourselves. Maybe we got to start. I would it. love to see any politician stand up and say, you know what? Oh, it's my side. That's part of the problem without saying, and so are they. Right. right. You know, um, you know, I mean, look, any, anybody who's in a relationship in a romantic relationship, you know full well that if you have a fight, it's not going to go well when you say, I'm sorry, but. Right. You know, we'll you know it's not going to well say, well, you started it. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I would be better if you. And yeah. if you just say, you're right. <laughs> Whether you started or not, you poured fuel on the fire. Like, I, I own it. Right. You know that that is the first step to reconciliation, to owning it and to taking responsibility for, for your part in it. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think the hard work starts at home. The, the other thing I think is language. And mm. I know this is, this, this, we forget about this. You talked about anti-bullying. Mm. Here's the problem with the human brain. <laughs> the human brain cannot I know where conceive, you're going. you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. The human brain cannot conceive of negative. You can't tell people not to do things. I'll give you, a lot, uh, I'll give you an example. You ready? Don't think of an elephant. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. And so when we say anti-bullying, all we're reminding people is of the bullying. Right. That's um, right. Um, as opposed to treat each other better, treat right. everybody right. better. Right. And, like we can't tell people to stop doing things. Right. And, and no, not to mention the fact nobody wants to reduce things. We want to build things. I don't want to wake up my whole life to stop something. Right. I want to wake up at my day to start something. It's like we talk about re reducing pro poverty as opposed to helping more people sustain the, the, their own lives and their own families. Right. Like, it, well, we did, you know, I want you to know, just because you're absolutely right, uh, the, the field which we built, which, which we call social and emotional learning, started with teaching self-regulation, teaching empathy, teaching communication skills, teaching agency, teaching service. And people always asked us, well, what's the function? What, what happens if you teach these things? What, what good is it? You know, what does it deliver? So we end up finding ourselves talking about preventing substance abuse, preventing violence and truancy, preventing bullying um, to appease what seems like a fixated mind on the negative. Yeah. But I can like, for instance, Esther Wojcicki, a teacher is in this book saying we have to renew our commitment to teaching compassion. Yeah to children. Yeah. Uh, maybe self-compassion to adults too, to your point, it's not just kids, but sometimes teaching children means the adults have to learn it. Yeah. And, um, so there's some ideas in here, you know, Dr. Rita Walker has a beautiful framing for how to manage conversations. She calls it the ABCs. Assume A is assume you can be of service. B is be a good listener. And C is cancel judgment. Yeah. So there's some, there's some, 
both personal developmental things. There's some challenges in this book about what we should do with education, what we can do to mend broken relationships, because many relationships have been broken, uh, deeply broken, I yeah. dare say, in recent months. Um, but if you look at the political side, uh, just to your point, if, if you were, if you had a magic wand, <laughs> if you were invited to give a speech at a joint session of Congress, yeah. uh, where would you, what, what would your advice be to, to not because our politicians are the only source or cause of our division, sure. but because maybe they could be enlisted to help us. How can we speak to larger audiences right now about what's, how we how we how we come to a new normal as Sir Ken wanted us. Well, I, I you know, I, I think and you and I have talked about this as well. I've become obsessed with the philosophies of Dr. Jim Kars. Uh, Dr. Jim Kars, bless his soul, died last year. Um, but in the mid 1980s, he articulated um, a definition of these two types of games, finite games and infinite games. Yeah. Um, uh, finite games are defined as known players, fixed rules and an agreed upon objective. Um, football, baseball, even an election. There's always a beginning, middle, and end. And if there is a winner, then necessarily there has to be a loser. Then there are infinite games. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players, which means new players can join at any time. The rules are changeable, which means every player can play however they want. And the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. Mm. Uh, the reality is, is we are players in infinite games every day of our lives, whether we know it or not. You know, there's no such thing as winning education. You can come in first for the finite amount of time you're at school, but nobody wins education. You can't win career. You can't win global politics. Um, you can't win governance. And you definitely can't win business. There's nobody's declared the winner of business. Right. But if you listen to the language of so many of our leaders, it becomes abundantly clear that they have no idea the game they're playing in because they talk about being number one, being the best or beating their competition based on right. what? Right. Based upon what agreed upon objectives, uh, timeframes or metrics. And the problem is, is when we play with a finite mindset in the infinite game, when we play to win in a game that has no finish line, there's a few consistent and predictable outcomes. The big ones include the decline of trust, the decline of cooperation, and the decline of innovation. Yeah. And I would start there because quite frankly, um, our politicians need to understand that when they're running for election, they are in a finite game. There's a beginning, middle, and end. There's fixed agreed upon rules. We know what the standards are. And if there's a winner, there's a loser. And the game concludes but once elected, you're now in an infinite game. You don't win governance, you know, and your responsibility as per the definition of the infinite game is to perpetuate the game, is to ensure that the institution is going to be left in better shape than you found it and will outlast you. Hmm. And the thing that I find magical about the infinite game and think about it in terms of business, right? Two companies selling the exact same product for about the same price, about the same quality, can both be wildly successful at the same time, right? Uh, when, and, and when Circuit City went bankrupt, Best Buy didn't actually win anything, right? right? And, and this is politics, which is both parties with different points of view about how to advance um, uh, what, is, what our country is founded upon, the Declaration of Independence, with different points of view about how we advance um, uh, that uh, that um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is provided to all, to all equally. We can both. You can actually both be successful at the same time. You can actually both have wins simultaneously. It doesn't require that one party is a winner and the other party has to lose. It just it's just not how the infinite game works. Right. And by the way, if you win a piece of legislation or something, well, the game's not over. Right. It perpetuates. <laughs> and if you screw one side, they're going to just get you back the next time. It's, it's, it's like Arab and Israelis. It's like, it's this tit for tat forever, both yeah. using the other's actions to justify my actions. It's, you, and so we have to recognize that the game changes the moment you're elected. Mm. And you have to play with an entirely different mindset. They're also obsessed with the finite game, as, is we, as we are in business, obsessed with the finite game of winning and losing in a game with no finish line that actually destroys trust, cooperation, and new ideas. Um, and so I think it starts with recognizing that they're playing for the wrong rules at the game that, for the game that they're actually in to their so, own detriment, the detriment of our country. And, and so how we do that, play the infinite game alongside the finite game, I think is yeah. what you're saying, right? You have to play both. 
you, the, the, you have to know the game you're in at the moment you're in it. Right. And, and the game is not the absence of when you're in the infinite game and play in the infinite game. It Correct. seems to me like this is a book a little bit about, if I dare say, about the infinite game. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And, you know, so when Jewel says in this book so beautifully, oh, my God, we're, we're, we're having a talk with her. If anybody wants to join uh, on Thursday, um, uh, uh, when she says that the hack, she calls it her hack for anxiety. Yeah. Is gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And she describes, you know, being homeless herself and uh, living on the streets, shoplifting, uh, uh, you know, this whole experience of alienation from her family and and finding at at a certain moment in her life uh, the capacity to draw inward and be grateful for all that she had, even when she seemed to have nothing, to your point. Did she have a lot or did she have nothing? She had both. Yeah. Uh, And she sort of found herself, I, I, if, if I were using this language, in the infinite game. Yeah. And it gave birth to her, a creative genius. Yeah. Um, that is, who is still, uh, and, and she's dedicating her life to young people, to, to teaching, yeah. using music and the gifts of empathy um, uh, and self-awareness and, uh, and mindfulness and compassion, uh, trying to teach those skills to other kids because there's a lot of kids yeah. We're going to not go back to school ready yeah. emotionally. Yeah. They're not going to know how to trust. They're not going to necessarily believe in themselves. They're not going to know what the future holds. They don't know if their parents are going to be okay. Yeah. And if we just start hitting them with quadratic equations and commas and semicolons and periods, and uh, we're going to miss the chance to build a stronger, a different version of us. Yeah. We, well, you know, I, we can't change this story of us without a new story. Well, I think, I think what you're, I think, I think, I think you're hundred percent right. And the call to unite of obviously is infinite because it, it, it this book is, it right. will last forever. You're offering some of the finite steps that we need to take along the line. And I think what you're talking about, especially when you talk about kids, we see this in business as well. You know, we see this, we talk about hard skills and soft skills. First of all, I hate the term soft skills because hard and soft are opposites. As if the skills we teach someone to do their job, like teaching the quadratic equations, is the opposite to teaching you how to be a good human being. Right. (laughs) You know? And so we need to call them hard skills and human skills. Mm -hmm. And we need to teach both. You need to teach the quadratic equations. We need to teach algebra and... We need to teach listening and patience, how to give and receive feedback, how to have difficult conversations. We need to do this in school and we need to do this at work. Hard skills and human skills, learning both make us productive members of our team and of society. And again, it goes back to language. We need to stop calling them soft. It makes them sound lesser. And I think that's one of the things that our nation unfortunately has done. We over-indexed over the past 40 years, we've over-indexed on rugged individualism. Mm-hmm. You know, the Marlboro man was the standard and most of the uh, incentive structures in our companies are based on individual performance. And we, we measure someone's value based on wealth or productivity. And if you're not productive, I've had a bad day as opposed to just being happy, right. relaxed. <laughs> imagine uh, that. <laughs> imagine that. So I think what you're talking about and I think what, what you're attempting to, to propose in, 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 in all the stories you brought together is the, is this rebalancing. Yeah. Um, and you bring in different perspectives from different, uh, people, um, as you said, some of, w- some of whom we've heard of and some of, we haven't that offer unique points of view that just remind us of, of, of the other, you know, you spend very little time on the hard skills. You spend all the time on the, on the human skills. Yeah. And, and that is what unites us. It's our it humanity. Seems like, it seems like that's where we're out of balance. And it's, our, it's our humanity that's out yeah. of balance. It's not, it's it's not our ability to get that, things done. Some of them, supply so, chain management. Exactly. But some of the best new companies, I've t- I talked a few years ago to the guy who was the head of HR at Google. Yeah. And uh, his point was, look, we can find coders anywhere. The hard skills and even people that come to us that don't know how to code, we can teach them in a couple of weeks. Yeah. He says, the key skills we look for are the skills of people who now to work on a team, because yeah. in our company, it is the team that has the capacity to be successful. Individuals actually are very, very uh, commodified, I guess I'd yeah. say is the word. So I think you're right. You're, you're, we're, in some ways, this call to unite this book is 
an invitation in other in another way it's just joining uh, a, uh what we, i like to call a blessed river there's 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 uh, as van jones says there's more awesome in this country than there is awful and there's a lot of creativity and there's a lot of simon cynic energy around no i mean i mean this with with both deep affection and and gratitude to you uh there's a lot of people who want to hear from you because they want to be that person that you remind them they can be. They Thank want you. to be like those soldiers who helped you to continue because they were with you. They want to be playing the infinite game alongside of having a job and providing for their family. Yeah. They want to work for justice and change the country for the better, but they want to do it in a way that's not hateful and full of contempt. Yeah. And, um, you know, my, my hope with this book is only that we can just give everybody who reads it and anybody who hears about it just a boost of confidence. Yeah. And a little bit of like, you know, here's some breadcrumbs. If you want more, you know, go to simonsinic.com. Well, if it's, you want it's, more, it's the work. It's the work. It's, 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 the work. it's like we want the body we want, but we have to do the work, you know? We have to do the work. Um, exactly. Hey, we have time. There's a question that came in from the audience. I'm going to ask it to you. Okay. Um, are people under an illusion? that we will feel more united just because we'll be back together again soon. I think being physically proximate does not mean being united. Uh, I think connection, physical connection is helpful to people. I mean, we're, we're not disembodied creatures, right? We like to touch. We like to hug. We like to hold hands. We like to look at each other's eyes. We like to check out what's going on around us. We like the buzz of a restaurant. We like the sounds of a stadium. We like, as you pointed out, to be together. You've said this so many times. So I think it will help us to be together. But if together means distracted, scared, anxious about the future, judging other people, who's that? Uh, has he gotten a shot? Has she, why isn't she doing it? Then we're just elevating anxiety again. So I think we can hope to be back together, but we have to come back differently. We have to go back with Dr. Rita Walker's ABCs. We have to come back with your game, uh, rules of the infinite game in mind. We have to come back, I hope, just with a little more compassion, like you described New York City after 9-11. Like if you just look across the restaurant and the waiter doesn't bring you your food or the bus driver doesn't smile at you, maybe just take a pause, as Greg Boyle says, instead of judging them for how they're behaving, just take a pause to admire how much they're carrying. Yeah. And maybe just take that little breath and say, you know, who knows what they've been through? Yeah. So maybe my meal isn't what I wanted, or maybe the whatever isn't working the way I wanted it to. Um, but maybe I can, in that little bit of listening, even if I'm listening without sound, just communicate a little bit of space for the others, uh, for others to, uh, to have a little bit of breath. And I, I, I hope and believe we have a chance. Let's put it that way. Yeah. We do have a chance. And there's enough good people in this country and there's enough new energy in this country that yeah. if we tap into it, I think, I think it can bring us back together much, much more uh, happily. I think, you know, if in the end of the day, all people want is to be happy or as do, uh, Dr. Barbara Holmes says here, you know, she says, you know, everything's going to be all right but it's going to be all right at the level of joy. It might not be all right every moment of happiness, but we can, we can be all right at the level of joy. I, I think, if I, we just give a little bit of a blessing to the other person, even if they don't deserve it. I think you're right. We can all be a little easier on each other. Yeah. Um, Tim, unfortunately, this is the We're time out of time. Our program. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Simon, you're, uh, uh, you're a gift. Thank uh, you. Congratulations and, on the book again. It's, it's thanks. really a triumph. Um, uh, it's been a blast. Um, so yeah. call to unite voices of hope and awakening um, in fine bookstores everywhere and some not so fine ones even. Um, <laughs> so you can, you can pick one up whenever you like to buy books. And um, simonsenic.com for more of Simon, unite.us for more of the unite movement and hopefully more things that we can do together in the weeks and months ahead. Agreed. Agreed. And this program and others will be published on the Commonwealth club website which is www. Do people still say www still? Anyway, uh, you can find it at commonwealthclub.org. Um, I'm Simon Sinek. That's Tim Shriver. Um, and this is the Commonwealth Club program. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Tim, uh, take care of yourself. Take care of uh, those. Grateful for you, Simon. Uh, thank you. Love you. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye.